Along Route 29 in Culpeper, Virginia, a small wooden cross and some artificial flowers mark the place where Alicia Reynolds was last seen alive 18 years ago. I never lose hope in being able to solve this case. For Virginia State Police Special Agent Richard Hankins, this is no ordinary investigation. You always what if that situation in your head. In 1996, Alicia Reynolds was living her dream. At 25, she was married about a year, studying to get her PhD in pharmacology at Johns Hopkins. She always had uh, a wonderful giggle and a wonderful smile. But when Reynolds never showed up for a March 2nd shopping date with her mother, Sadie Showalter, her family became alarmed. Later that day, her car was found abandoned along Route 29, its hood up. Witnesses told police they saw Reynolds getting into a Nissan pickup. I just instinctively knew that she was gone. The really tough times were then from March 2nd to May 7th when her body was found. Reynolds' remains were found in this area in rural Lignum, Virginia. It looked much different back then. It was just a field. That discovery ended one chapter of this investigation and opened up another, which remains unsolved to this day, as to who killed this young woman. Police won't say how Reynolds died, and they're not giving specifics on DNA or other evidence. Investigators have issued this sketch, but say this 1996 rendering is likely dated I begin every day with this case. He and the Showalters stay in close touch, talking at least once a month. It, it keeps me grounded and it gives me motivation to keep forward. Showalter often thinks of what might have been. There's that empty space and you miss her every day, but you, you keep on and you have other things to um, give you joy and give you hope. You can't give up faith because if, if, if there was no hope, there would be no use in looking into it. Yeah, Leslie, they called the killer the Route 29 stalker. Two decades, 10,189 leads, and Virginia State Police say they are still looking for the man who tried to stop 20 or more women along the highway and ultimately kidnapped and murdered Alicia Showalter Reynolds. Alicia was this very, I don't know if I can. Uh, the 21st anniversary of her daughter's murder. Talented, um, kind, gentle soul. Sadie Showalter says this is an especially painful time of year for her family. Her twin brother and her younger sister, and also uncles and aunts and cousins uh, that all loved her and are missing her today. Alicia was 25, driving to Charlottesville from graduate school in Baltimore. Here's our phone number. If anyone sees anything about that, we'd okay. really appreciate a call. Okay. State police Thanks suspect her killer flagged her down with a ruse, that there were sparks flying out from under her car. Let her go. Get <laughs> we want her back. 20 or more women came forward and described a white guy about six feet tall who tried the same trick on them. Two months after Alicia disappeared, a local spotted vultures and found her body in a desolate field. It had to be someone that knew the area. The Showalters have long suspected Richard Mark Evidence, the serial killer who murdered Kristen and Katie Lisk and Sophia Silva. You usually don't have two serial killers uh, in the same area around the same time. But investigators have told her evidence is unlikely. The only other um, uh, possibility is that there is yet an unidentified suspect. The family is desperate enough for answers to plead directly with their daughter's killer. My message would be, why hide? Uh, you've hit, you've been hidden long enough. She's missed greatly. Alicia Showalter Reynolds was 25 years old when she disappeared on March 2nd, 1996. 
She was last seen along US 29 from Baltimore to Charlottesville. Her body was found two months later buried in a remote area of lignum that had been recently cleared of trees. Alicia was a John Hopkins University graduate student who was living in Baltimore with her husband at the time of her disappearance. She was last seen getting into the dark pickup, possibly a Nissan, with a man whose only public trace to this day are sketches that were given by passerbys. Now, the witnesses described the man seen with Alicia as um, a white man, about 35 to 45 years old, with a medium build and light to medium brown hair. He was about 5 feet 10 to 6 feet tall and was driving a dark colored pickup, possibly a green Nissan. Anyone with information regarding the, man, the abduction and murder of Alicia Showalter Reynolds is asked to contact state police at 1-800-577-2260. I'll leave the information in the description box. Julianne Williams and Laura Lolly Winans. In May of 1996, Julie got a new job in Lake Champlain, Vermont. So she and Lolly decided to go on a camping trip along the Appalachian Trail at Shenandoah National Park in Virginia so that they could enjoy some free time together before Julie started her job. They plan to go back home for a friend's wedding on June 1st and on May 19, the couple left for a backpacking trip with their Golden Retriever Taj stopping at Pinnacles Overlook on Skyline Drive. Julie and Lolly enjoyed a few days of hiking in the mountains and that's where they were last seen alive on May 24th. On May 31st, Julie's father reported her daughter I'm sorry, not her. Julie's father reported Lolly missing, and he and he only known Lolly to be Julie's friend. Didn't know that they were a couple. Um, park rangers began to search, finding the couple's dog Taj wandering around unleashed. Julie and Lolly were not with him. The next day, on June first, rangers found the bodies of Julie and Lolly at their campsite on Bridal Trail a part of the horse trail system that runs from Big Meadows to Skyland. The bodies were found stripped naked, bound, and gagged, and both had their throats slit. There was no signs of sexual assault, and one body was found inside the tent, and the other outside. Now, after the murders, um, a lot of people did not know that Lolly and Julie were lesbians, and um, so both the families were shot. They didn't have, you know, because they did not know that their daughters were gay. Um, it was a shot for the LGBT community as well. Um, the Vermont Coalition there um, for Lesbian and Gay Rights recognized the killings as a hate crime. So soon after the discovery of the bodies, the FBI joined the local police and park rangers in the investigation. Um, authorities ruled out robbery as a motive since nothing was missing. They found the girls' cameras with pictures of the trip in it. It wasn't the first time that a murder had took place in the Appalachian Trail, however. Um, Julie and Lolly's murders were the eighth and ninth that had occurred there. So, um, yeah, one of the murders was of a lesbian woman who was shot to death by a man who saw her kissing her girlfriend. Um, the murderers served a life sentence and he was in prison when Julie and Lolly were murdered. So the FBI did not link the murders to any of previous crimes that happened there at the Appalachian Trail um, because they couldn't find any evidence that would say so. So um, they, however, seem to connect the murders to another double murder of a lesbian couple that took place on October 1986 in the Colonial in Colonial Parkway, Virginia. 
Um, the victims were Rebecca Dowski and Kathleen Thomas, who were found dead in a car that had been pushed off an embankment near Williamsburg. Their throats were slashed by a sharp object, their wrists had been bound, and there was no sign of struggle. Both women were fully clothed and there were no sign of sexual assault. Their wallets and purse were left in the car, ruling out that it was a robbery. Um, so it was believed that a serial killer was responsible for those murders. But the FBI had never found any actual evidence that linked the two cases together. So they offered a $25,000 reward for any information. Um, just to see if the, you know, the murders were connected in any type of way, which they could not. So they asked for the public's assistance. Our series vanished with one case. Sage Smith's family has been desperate for answers but received very little help. They were stunned when a young woman in their town went missing and watched as they felt like the entire community showed up to search. Please look, this is the face of someone who has vanished. And for reasons beyond their family's control, you may not have heard this story on the news or in the papers. Sage Smith was born a boy, and to put a finer point on it, a black boy, who according to his family is gender fluid. The first thing we think of is his smile. Um, he had like the biggest, brightest smile. Deshad, as they call him at home, mysteriously disappeared from Charlottesville, Virginia in November of 2012. Smith's family says that no one in the press, in law enforcement, or the community really cared at the time because their child was different. It took a, a long time. Um, it was a while before it actually was on the news, the local news. Not on the first day? No. Not on the second day? No. It, it was quite some time. Yeah. I remember calling down there and asking when is it going to be on there. It was Tuesday, November 20th, just 19 years old, and the last time anyone saw Smith alive. Witnesses remember seeing a pretty smile buried deep into a cell phone. Sage Smith was meeting someone that night, a friend, possibly a date according to a roommate, and was seen at this cafe on Main Street. They were supposed to be meeting here in front of this train station, but the young man Sage was connecting with says that meeting never happened. Latasha Dennis and her two oldest daughters tell a familiar story that's shared too often from families of color. When their loved ones go missing, police are slow to respond. How many calls would you say you had, there are conversations you think you had to get, you had to have with the police before you were taken seriously? You know, I remember, uh you know, they're coming out and talking um, to me and coming to my job, um, taking down information and stuff. But yeah, I don't feel like we got that much from it. I mean, yeah, even initially, it didn't really feel like full involvement from the police. At the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Director Robert Lowry told us that roughly 800,000 Americans go missing each year. What percentage of those are African American or of color? About 60% of the reports that we see here in the U.S. that go into those databases. More than about half. Well over half. It really breaks a lot of, of commonly held thought on who are really the missing children. In the, US. the numbers show that missing black Americans are disproportionately represented. In 2018, more than 30% of all missing persons were black Americans, despite making up just 13% of the total U.S. population. But only around a fifth of those cases are followed by the news. Smith was last seen here on the 500 block of Main Street here in Charlottesville wearing a black jacket, dark gray sweatpants, and black boots. The family has canvassed the street many times with photos and flyers, but all they ever find is a dead end. When the family put together a search of their own, there were no cameras, no police, and they say few people showed. I remember reaching out to um, a church, um, local church here, and asked um, the um, uh, pastor to help me organize a um, search. We kind of put it out there for the community um, to help us, and.
no little sister should have to carry. At 19, he was taken from us without any explanation and hasn't been given any justice. Hearts hurting for Sage Smith. Charlottesville police can't share much about the investigation. But Smith was supposed to meet up with Eric McFadden, an acquaintance on November 20th, 2012. Smith was last seen on West Main Street. The family and community need answers and closure. To get that closure, police have been searching for McFadden, who skipped an interview soon after Smith went missing. Police had been in contact with McFadden's father as recently as two weeks ago. McFadden's mother just filed a missing persons report yesterday. Police say there appears to have been a lack of communication between the 28-year-old's parents. We are asking you, Eric McFadden, to please come into the Charlottesville Police Department to answer any questions. Without telling us how they pinpointed these locations, police say McFadden may have traveled to cities like Baltimore, New York City, and even as far as Rochester, New York. Detectives read a statement from McFadden's mom. I would like Eric to know that if he is out there and needs help, he can call his mom. Smith was transgender, comfortable dressing as a man and woman. Mom Latasha Dennis says her child's gender identity should not be the focus. Instead, she needs to know what happened to her baby. And the fact remains that my child is missing. And that to me all, is all that matters. Um, I am in a, a situation where I cannot grieve and I just need... at this Henrico landfill will continue. Meantime, a support official for transgendered people is weighing in. Even if you see his pictures, it just exudes happiness. It was infectious. He loved life. Those closest to him are not losing hope their loved one will return home. Deshaun Smith, 19 at the time, went missing in November. Police believe Smith went to an Amtrak station to possibly meet Eric McFadden before he disappeared. Charlottesville police consider McFadden a person of interest, though they're not calling him a suspect. He denied meeting Smith and has since left town. I strongly believe that him and Deshaun did meet that night. What what happened after that meeting, there's 38 minutes where the phone got turned off and never turned on again. Somewhere in that 38 minutes, something happened. We will not know what happened until we get McFadden back to question him and to actually find out what's going on. Investigators' plans to search the Old Dominion landfill today fell through, but they say they will return this month to search for clues. Today, the landfill's general manager told us the landfill's parent company remains willing to cooperate with police throughout this investigation. Smith's family wonders if the fact that he's sometimes dressed as a woman is linked to the fact he's still missing. People who cross those boundaries are targeted. Ted Heck is a facilitator for a transgender support group in Richmond. He says while he doesn't know what happened to Smith, a number of factors could come into play. You know, there was a statewide study done that showed that 40% of uh, trans-identified people had experienced some form of physical violence, and many of them had experienced that more than once. He says it's important people like Smith have an outlet to vent. There's uh, a lot of pressure in our society to conform to traditional gender norms. The isolation that people experience can uh, put them in very dangerous situations. A $10,000 reward through a private donation is now available for Smith.